Hello, good morning. Thank you for joining us today for a webinar for the recently released report, Vibrant and Healthy Kids, Aligning Science, Practice, and Policy to Advance Health Equity. A free downloadable copy of the report and related resources are available at nationalacademies.org slash vibrant healthy kids. The slides and recording of this webinar will be available there next week as well. And if you wish to follow the conversation on social media, we will be using the hashtag vibrant healthy kids. For those of you who are not familiar with the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, we are private nonprofit institutions that provide independent, objective analysis and advice to the U.S. to solve complex problems and inform public policy decisions related to science, technology, and medicine. For each requested study, panel members are chosen for their expertise and experience, and they serve pro bono to carry out the study's statement of task. The reports that result from the study represent the consensus view of the committee, and they must undergo external peer review before they are released, as did this report. I have with me several members of the committee to discuss the report, but before I introduce the committee, I want to go over a few reminders. Please note this webinar is scheduled to last one hour. We'll start off with a presentation by the committee members, and then we'll open it up to the Q&A. You can simply click the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen to submit a question. And if you have any technical issues during this webinar, please contact Zoom Technical Support at 1-888-799-9666. Six, six, and select option two. Now I'd like to introduce the members of the committee that wrote the report who are here with us today. We have the committee chair, Dr. Jennifer DeVoe, who is chair of the Department of Family Medicine at Oregon Health and Science University. Next, we have Dr. Nadine Burke Harris, Surgeon General of the State of California. We have Dr. Elizabeth Davis, Professor of Applied Economics at the University of Minnesota. Dr. Pat Levitt, Chief Scientific Officer, Children's Hospital of Los Angeles, and Keck Provost Professor at the Keck School of Medicine at the University of California. We have Dr. Natalie Slopin, Assistant Professor of Epidemiology and Biostatistics at the University of Maryland School of Public Health. And finally, Albert Watt, who is Senior Policy Director of Alliance for Early Success. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to our Chair, Dr. Jennifer DeVoe, who will kick off the presentation. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Again, we had uh, an amazing committee, uh, very multidisciplinary, broadly representative of several disciplines. You'll see all of the committee members' names listed here. The committee was funded to um, take on a very large statement of task that was sponsored by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And as you'll see here, we had a broad statement of task. We were asked to briefly overview the early life stressors that affect the prenatal through early childhood development and health, and then move on into action. So identifying models and opportunities to translate science to action, to measure the outcomes, to develop a roadmap, and provide significant recommendations in how systems can better align to advance health equity. There is an incredible problem, many problems actually, um, and important for health equity, and um, this is listing just a few examples of early life experiences that have profound impact on the health outcomes in childhood, adulthood, and across generations. The next slide shows the committee process. Um, again, as I mentioned, we had a very dedicated, inspirational committee. We held five action-packed meetings. Um, during these meetings, we received input from a broad range of invited experts. Many of our meetings were open to the public. We had deliberative committee meetings. Over the year, we prepared a nine-chapter report. And this report then underwent external peer review by 12 expert reviewers. 
all recommendations in the report were um, driven by consensus. All committee members um, agreed with all recommendations in the entire report and then responded to expert peer reviewers. Our committee approach um, was a population health, public health approach in which we used a health equity lens. We did comprehensive literature review and used the foundation of two previous reports, the 2000 Institute of Medicine report from Neurons to Neighborhoods and the 2017 Academy's report Communities in Action. We embraced the life course approach and focused um, even before the prenatal period all the way to preconception through early childhood and provided recommendations for practice policy and systems change. To guide our work, the committee adapted several concepts from previous conceptual models in order to create our conceptual framework. Within the context of the life course from preconception to adulthood, the diagram's nested circles illustrate the complex sociocultural environment that shapes development at the individual level. These circles also illustrate opportunities for interventions to improve individual health and developmental outcomes, as well as population health and health equity. So in the center is representative of the individual socio-behavioral, psychological, and biological mechanisms that operate and interact within and across these three levels. Culture is also operating at all levels. The inner gray ring surrounding the child represents the factors that most directly and proximally shape children's daily experiences and routine practices. These include caregiver well-being, social connections, and family cohesion, which affects social connections in early life. The next level, the light blue ring, represents the social, economic, and environmental conditions. These interdependent factors are grouped into three domains, identified as our committee as being critically important for targeting prenatal and early childhood interventions including healthy living conditions, early care and education, and health systems and services. And within each of these domains, we identified evidence-based solutions, opportunities for intervention, barriers, promising models, and future research needs. And then the outer level, the green ring, representing the socioeconomic and political drivers, this is the level at which structural inequities operate. And as one example, on the next slide, we show um, statistics related to poverty being one of these significant socioeconomic drivers, which affects the developing brain and cognitive outcomes of children. Also recognizing that children are disproportionately among the populations living in poverty, and that black, American Indian, Alaska Native, and Hispanic children disproportionately live in low-income and poor households, and also are more likely to live in deep poverty. The report in brief has nine chapters and 30 recommendations. We start with overviews of the science and updating the significant body of evidence that shows the impact of biological and environmental factors, sorry, social and environmental factors on the biology, psychology, and socio-behavioral development of children, and how the biology and environment work together to affect children's growth and development. And then dive into chapter four through eight, where there are a significant number of recommendations that are guided by the conceptual framework in the different levels of impact that we described in the framework. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Pat Levitt, who will dive into talking about much of what's in the earlier chapters of the report. Highlight a few. I just want to highlight a few. Um, the first is that we, while we've known that early experiences are essential for uh, building healthy brain architecture, the new science has demonstrated that uh, in, in addition to the brain, uh, the developing immune system, metabolic systems, and, and other organ systems of the, of the child are influenced by early experiences and that, in fact, the science shows that these different systems, uh, in, in essence, talk to each other and influence each other's uh, development. So that um, early adversity that we 
had once focused on in terms of its impact on brain development. In fact, we know affects other organ systems as well, and that, that aligns with what we know epidemiologically in, in terms of uh, early adversity increasing risk for both physical and mental health um, uh, problems later on in, in uh, life. Um, the second is that we've defined uh, much more clearly what, what sensitive periods of time are that, uh, that maximize experience in terms of driving development of the brain and other organ uh, systems, and that early adversity can change those periods of time. They can shift them earlier, they can make them shorter, and that will have an overall impact on development. And then the third uh, on this slide is that in addition to what we focused on in the past in terms of the research about regarding um, um, experiences like abuse and neglect, we know that other factors now, institutional factors that limit access to resources, such as institutional racism and discrimination, can have powerful negative influences on the primary caregiver, and that will impact the development of the child as well. Next slide. Um, since neurons tend to neighborhoods, there's been a, a, a growing body of evidence demonstrating that even from preconception and certainly uh, during uh, pregnancy, that uh, factors that influence uh, development can occur starting even uh, prior to fertilization. Um, among the factors that we think are most important in terms of buffering negative experiences are relationships between the, the child and the primary caregivers, and the relationship actually starts prenatally with the health of the mother and the father as well in terms of reducing um, early life stress. Uh, there's a, really an a, abundant amount of science that has now focused on demonstrating that psychosocial, nutritional, access to uh, quality health care are all powerful components that have an impact on the primary caregiver's life and therefore, by definition, will have an impact on the, the development of the, of the child as well. Next slide. So there's some implications to the science that I just wanted to briefly uh, review. Uh, next slide. So. Um, one of the recommendations in Chapter 4 focused on um, the creation and implementation of programs that ensure families have access to high-quality, cost-effective, um, local community-based programs that support psychosocial well-being of the primary caregivers. Many of the interventions that, have, that uh, have been developed over the years focused principally on the child, but because we know that one of the most important experiences or factors in child development is their, uh, their environment of relationships, that uh, factors that benefit the well-being of the caregiver are critically important for the development of the child. Next slide. Um, another recommendation in terms of caregiver well, well-being is that research uh, programs which generally have focused on maternal infant interactions or prenatal health. Uh, uh, the mom need to also include a focus on the father that will have an impact on re reducing family stress and promoting healthy development both pre and postnatally. So targeting fathers and caregivers, uh, particularly from underserved populations, in research going forward is, is an important uh, Im, Im, implication of the science that we have thus far. Next slide. Um, we also believe that um, because all children are not identical, and we know that different interventions uh, can have different effects and outcomes on children because of their, we call heterogeneity, that research portfolios need to focus on this more and more to develop interventions that are flexible, are culturally sensitive, and tailored to meet the needs of subgroups of children that may respond to one intervention much more positively than another in intervention. So that flexibility is really critical. Next slide. Um, there's been a accumulating evidence that home visitation uh, has uh, a significant impact positive in, in impact on family and on development that starts prenatally. Um, so 
Uh, the committee has recommended uh, expanding maternal, infant, and early childhood home visitation programs that fosters the promote that fosters uh, relationships, uh, both beginning prenatally and and af after birth. Again, this issue of flexibility has come up because of the research that shows that those programs that are most flexible to accommodate specific needs of states and communities are going to be the most effective. And then strengthening programmatic coordination uh, bet between home visiting and early care and education and, and health access programs is critically important. Next slide. I'm going to turn it over to Liz now. Thanks, Pat. This is Elizabeth Davis from the University of Minnesota. In the report's conceptual model, the committee identifies healthy living conditions as an important domain. It was the second outermost ring in the conceptual framework. For the purposes of this report, healthy living conditions are the social, economic, cultural, and environmental factors that shape the odds for op optimal child health and development. Specifically, these include economic security, nutrition and food security, housing, neighborhood conditions, and environmental exposures. These living conditions are interdependent and interact with multiple levels of the conceptual model. Now, we know that children's well-being and health outcomes are known to be strongly related to family income. Poverty, especially in early childhood, or if it is long-lasting, is associated with significant detrimental effects on children's health, development, and well-being, both in the short term and over the life course. 21% of children under the age of nine, that's 15 million children, live in poor families. And the child poverty rates are uh, higher for American Indian, Alaskan Native, African American, and Hispanic children. Reducing poverty by increasing the economic resources families have available to meet their basic needs when children are young will be a critical foundational strategy for improving health outcomes and reducing health inequities. Therefore, uh, the committee recommends that policymakers address the critical gaps that exist between family resources and family needs through a combination of benefits that have the best evidence of advancing health equity, such as increased SNAP or food stamp benefits, increased housing assistance, and a basic income allowance for families with young children. The committee focused on programs or policies with the strongest evidence in terms of improving child health outcomes. A combination of programs SNAP, housing assistance, and a child allowance is recommended in order to meet the needs of families in different circumstances. Next slide. Along these same lines, given the importance of nutrition for brain development during the preconception, prenatal, and early childhood periods, providing resources to ensure families have access to sufficient and healthy foods is critical. A large body of literature links WIC and SNAP to positive outcomes such as consumption of healthy foods, reductions in poverty, and decreases in food insecurity. There's also strong evidence that SNAP participation leads to improved birth outcomes and better child health. Therefore, the committee recommends that policymakers reduce barriers to participation in the SNAP and WIC programs so that all eligible families are able to participate. And receipt of these types of benefits should not be tied to parental employment for families with young children as work requirements are likely for, to reduce participation rates. On the next slide, another area of healthy living conditions is housing. Healthy early development cannot occur without safe and stable housing. Lack of affordable housing and environmental hazards in housing can disrupt healthy child development as well as have negative effects on the well-being of parents and caregivers. Housing affordability and quality is an acute problem that disproportionately affects people of color and contributes to health disparities among children. Current federal housing programs are not adequately funded and there are not enough safe, affordable housing units in high opportunity areas. Therefore, the committee recommends that the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development and public housing authorities at all levels of government increase the supply of high quality, affordable housing that's available to families, especially those with young children. And the committee recommends that federal agencies work together to develop a comprehensive plan to ensure access to stable, affordable, and self and safe housing in the prenatal through early childhood period. This strategy should particularly focus on populations who are dis disproportionately impacted by housing challenges and experiencing poor health outcomes. Finally, in terms of healthy living conditions and housing, the committee also makes recommendations to prevent and mitigate the effects of harmful environmental toxicants 
during the prenatal and early childhood periods. The committee recommends focusing on reducing exposure to toxicants in the home and community, in early care and education settings, and increased screening and training for healthcare professionals. Next slide, please. One of the key messages of the report is how very early life experiences matter based on the science of development. Given the strong scientific evidence on the importance of relationships uh, with primary caregivers, the committee recommends that a national program of paid parental leave be implemented. Short paid leave has been associated with improved health outcomes, in particular reduced infant and child mortality, improved maternal health, and increased rates of breastfeeding. The U.S. is currently the only OECD country without a national paid leave policy, although a few states have passed such programs. The current unpaid leave through the Family and Medical Leave Act does not cover all employees, and many low and even middle class families cannot afford an unpaid leave. Paid parental leave grants parents greater opportunities to take time out of the labor force to attend to their children's needs. It acknowledges the special needs of infants and the importance of the infant caregiver relationship for brain development and health outcomes. Next slide. Therefore, the committee recommends that policymakers implement a paid parental leave program. In considering the details of such a program, policymakers working with researchers should consider variations in the level of benefits, the length of leave, and funding mechanisms that will have the largest impacts on improving child health outcomes and reducing health disparities. I'm now going to turn it over to Dr. Nadine Burke-Harris to shift from social determinants of health to the healthcare system itself. In order to improve the health and advance health equity, the committee recognizes that our healthcare system has a critical role to play. Healthy development of children begins before birth, and therefore the committee recognizes the preconception, prenatal, postpartum, and early childhood periods as important opportunities to set health and developmental trajectories. Key elements to setting those odds include access to care, quality of care, organization and alignment of care, and content of care. And the committee set a vision of our healthcare system as one that assures access to high quality healthcare across the, across the life course and incorporates the science of how our environments affect our health in transforming preconception, prenatal, postpartum, and pediatric care. In addition, uh, we envision a system that responds to the needs of children and their families holistically and through team-based care, connecting them with community resources and integrating services across the life course. Next slide, please. Access to care matters. And for children, their parents' access to care matters. For many Americans, there still exist significant barriers to meaningful access. And we recognize that longitudinal care is important. Current, our current system has significant fragmentation uh, between the, the prenatal, the preconception, prenatal, early childhood uh, period. And therefore, the committee recommends that the Department of Health and Human Services, Medicaid agencies, payers, and policymakers adopt policies and practices to ensure universal access to high quality health care across the life course, and particularly reducing barriers to access to care, uh, such as increasing culturally and linguistically appropriate outreach and services. Next slide, please. Despite the evidence of the strong impact of early life experiences on setting health trajectories, current healthcare metrics don't adequately assess the impact of early life determinants of health. Therefore, the committee recommends improving the quality of care by establishing new metrics of child and family health and well being to assess quality in using a holistic view of health and health equity. We recommend that agencies invest in research and support the development and implementation of new measures of accountability, including key drivers of health, such as social determinants, along with measuring variations by key subgroups to determine disparities. Next slide, please. Mechanisms of improving the quality of care include 
quality collaboratives, uh, such as prenatal, perinatal, and pediatric quality collaboratives that use continual quality improvement, learning communities, as well as pay for performance. And therefore, the committee recommends investment in those tools. In addition, we recognize that diversity matters, especially in healthcare. We call upon, uh, we call upon the healthcare system to invest and expand efforts to increase diversity, inclusion, and equity in our healthcare workforce, particularly through diversity intensive outreach, mentoring, networking, and leadership development for underrepresented faculty and trainees. Next slide, please. As we understand the impact of social and environmental factors on children's developing brains and bodies, it's clear that our organization and integration of care must be updated to feasibly allow our healthcare system to appropriately respond to these scientific advances. More care has to be integrated with community resources, and therefore the committee recommends uh, that we invest in programs uh, that build on home visiting, referrals to community partners, and integrated community efforts that have enhanced outcomes for children and families. That will require new payment arrangements that can accelerate transformation of health services to, uh, to programs that support families and population health. And therefore, the committee recommends that the Department of Health and Human Services, Medicaid agencies, and health system leaders and policymakers adopt policies and practices to improve the organization and integration of healthcare systems incorporating multidisciplinary team-based care uh, and models that focus on integrating preconception, prenatal, and postpartum care into a whole family focus. Next slide, please. An individual who has four or more adverse childhood experiences has more than double the risk of ischemic heart disease, the number one killer in the United States. And yet our current practice guidelines don't give providers adequate guidance as to how to mitigate these health risks. Therefore, the committee recommends that the Department of Health and Human Services convene an expert panel to reconceptualize the content and delivery of care, identifying the specific changes that would be needed and developing a blueprint for this transformation, uh, as well as implementing a plan to monitor and revise this blueprint over time. Implementation of this recommendation will require an update in clinical care guidelines and standards by the bodies that provide such guidelines, as well as an update of medical accreditation bodies, uh, relevant programs and agencies to develop performance monitoring and quality improvement based on this new content of care. It will require Edu clinical education authorities, such as the ACGME, to develop curriculum, training, and experiences and competencies based on these updated guidelines, as well as public and private payers to cover services reflecting this new content. And I will now uh, pass on to my colleague to continue. Good morning, this is Albert Watt from the Alliance for Early Success, and I am here to cover the chapter on early care and education. So to arrive at the findings and recommendations around the ECE, the committee reviewed the broad research uh, uh, around the linkage of ECE and health outcomes. And this graphic basically uh, kind of captures that, what we found, um, which is that basically that early care and education, high quality early care and ed education has both um, uh, impact, positive impacts on social emotional health and physical health outcomes in the short term. And these short term outcomes can lead to low risk of dropping out from school, greater school engagement, and subsequently better educational attainment, which results in um, increased income in health care, decreased social and health risk, and improved health equity. Um, so we basically conclude that early care and education can be uh, an important part of a health promotion strategy. But in order for that to happen, um, our, the first recommendation we have is that the early care and education system needs to take a comprehensive approach in order for it to be a platform for a health promotion strategy. And what we mean by a, health, a comprehensive approach 
um, it's spelled out in the in the report, and I'll just um, share a few things uh, to let people know what we mean by that. So I think the first thing is that early care education um, systems can, through their standards, policies, and practices, um, uh, provide actually health services, direct health services through, the, through these programs, whether it's through co-location of services, through embedding these services into the program standards and operations, or through uh, resources that help these programs and professionals refer children and families to health-related services. Another um, a part of the comprehensive approach has to do with a strong social emotional learning curriculum or, or program that includes evidence-based curriculum as well as training and supports for the professionals, early child educators to implement that curriculum effectively. Another part of the comprehensive approach is to have a highly trained and supported, well-supported workforce, which I'll get to a little later. And fourth, um, also another part of it is the strong family engagement uh, component that uh, has evidence base behind its impact, such as uh, connections with home visiting. Um, so, uh, so, so in terms of the next oh, actually next slide, please. Sorry. Um, so, in, in addition to incorporating these comprehensive standards and practices in the in ECE systems. Uh, the committee also recommends that um, agencies that have jurisdiction over these programs establish program standards and accountability, accountability systems um, and, uh, and also do some cost analysis to, de to determine the adequate funding and resources necessary to implement this kind of comprehensive approach. Um, next slide, please. Um, and uh, as and, and and in, along with that, we also recommend that these agencies um, examine the fe feasibility and seek resources to conduct um, an implementation study about how these uh, kind of comprehensive ECE programs and systems can be, um, can be implemented and also do, uh, do some analysis of outcomes as we implement this so that we understand you know, the, how the implementation actually in, uh, leads to impacts for, for children and families. The next recommendation has to do with the workforce, as I mentioned earlier. So um, in order to, um, for easy systems and programs to have this kind of impact on health, we need an early child education workforce that um, has, uh, is well-trained to and with competencies related to these practices. So what we mean by that is um, in, includes strengthening the professional's understanding of and capacity to collaborate with professionals from other sectors to support health um, outcomes and health equity, educating professionals about unconscious bias and practices that undermine uh, the learning and socio-emotional health of diverse children and the families, training and coaching on effective anti-bias anti and cultural responsive practices that strengthen these professionals' effectiveness in supporting the learning, social-emotional health, and well-being of diverse children and families, and effectively implementing practices and policies informed by understanding of trauma. Um, in addition, the report also um, recommends that the workforce also needs to be supported themselves um, in terms of how they're compensated, the working conditions, and also uh, skills to manage their own um, stress and, and, and uh, even trauma in some cases. And finally, the last recommendation in this section has to do with access and affordability of ECE programs. So even if um, our EC, current EC programs and systems adopt these practices and standards that I talked about earlier, um, unfortunately right now, um, many children in our country don't have access to EC programs, especially those who can benefit the most from them. So what this um, recommendation um, uh, is about is, is it's both about strengthening and expanding. So as we strengthen this, these programs and, and systems to incorporate uh, these kinds of health-related uh, practices and standards, that we also work towards uh, 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 expanding access to all eligible children um, in, in the programs that, at the federal, local, and state level. So um, specifically, we, um, so we recommend that the policymakers should work with the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Office of Head Start, and Office of Child Care to develop and implement a plan to improve the quality of ECE programs um, by adopting the, the, the health-promoting standards discussed in this report, and that within 10 years we expand access to such comprehensive, high-quality, and affordable ECE programs across multiple settings to all eligible children. 
we also recommend that as we do this that the, um, the HHS conduct the process evaluation to make sure that, again, as we implement and expand these programs, that we learn about what's, what, what's working, what's not, and, and how these programs are really impacting kids and families. Great. Thank you so much. Um, this is Dr. Jennifer DeVoe again, and just wanted to, again, reiterate that building on the effective interventions and work happening in the many sectors highlighted is critically important. The committee also recommended that advancing health equity in the preconception through early childhood periods cannot be achieved by any one of these sectors alone, and that translating science into action will take collaboration and alignment across all sectors that frequently interact with children, families, and the professionals who serve them. So Chapter 8 is dedicated to many of these cross-sector initiatives and recommendations, and I will briefly introduce those now. So the first is to address barriers to data sharing and integration, cross-sector financing, and other challenges to collaboration. The second is to enhance detection of early life adversity and improve our response systems. Next slide. Our third is to develop trauma-informed systems in all sectors and collaboration across these trauma-informed systems such that sectors can learn from each other best practices. The fourth is to build a diverse culturally informed workforce in all relevant systems. And fifth, to improve access to programs and policies across systems that provide parental and caregiver supports and to encourage wraparound services and bundled services for families. Next slide shows the sixth and seventh, which include a comprehensive support for the whole person by leveraging and connecting existing community resources and supporting payment reform to allow for upstream investment. And our next slide summarizes some of the key concepts of the report that are woven throughout the many chapters. The first is to intervene early. These periods in early life are foundational for healthy development across the life course. The second, to address systemic and structural factors, that individual experiences within systems vary dramatically based on racial, cultural, and other personal characteristics and that these set the odds for an individual but are no means deterministic. And when different odds play out, they generate systematically different health outcomes. A health equity approach requires systems to change in ways that improve opportunities for experiences that are positive and reduce the odds for negative experiences and adverse exposures. And third, the interconnected nature of health disparities the systems that influence developmental and health trajectories are profoundly interconnected, and that the impact of any one of these systems will inevitably ripple across and shape what happens in others. And finally, our last slide highlights the roadmap that is our Chapter 9 that shows many of these key concepts and other recommendations intervene early, support caregivers, reform healthcare system services to promote healthy development, create supportive and stable early living conditions, maximize the potential of early care and education to promote health outcomes, redesign the content of preconception, prenatal, postpartum, and pediatric care while assuring ongoing access, quality, and coordination, implement initiatives across systems to support children, families, other caregivers, and communities, and integrate and coordinate resources across the education, social services, criminal justice, and healthcare systems, and make them available to translate science to action. That concludes our formal presentation, and we would like to thank you very much for joining us and for your commitment to all of our nation's children, families, and communities, and to health equity. And I also want to re remind people that our report and many materials, including these slides, and other resources will be available from the National Academies at their website. Thank you very much. We're going to move on to the Q&A, and I understand there are some questions that have come through, and Stephanie will read one of those now. 
The first question we have is for Pat, and it is to what extent are prenatal and later interventions too late? Wouldn't it be more effective to reduce or manage chronic stress pre-pregnancy? Is this reflected in recommendations? Why, why not? So I think the, the recommendations included a, a recognition that the science says that, in fact, preconception um, the stressors that, in effect, uh, uh, adults will will have and can have an impact on development of the the offspring. The, at Neurons to Neighborhoods, when it was released, uh, focused mostly on postnatal development, and over, over the last um, almost 20 years, uh, a lot of work has been done prenatally, and the work in preconception is. Uh, I think relatively new over the last five years in terms of demonstrating that um, experiences can have an impact on our DNA and that can uh, change things positively or, or negatively in terms of in terms of uh, risk. So uh, the question focuses on timing and too late. Um, the research says that. Um, having positive environments for development during the periods of time when the fetus is developing and when the child is developing post, uh, uh, post early postnatally and into toddlerhood and early childhood uh, can have significant positive impacts. The other thing to, that, that science says, which I think is really important, is that the child and the systems don't develop synchronously at once. That is, there are some aspects of development that occur, occur over a long period of time. For example, more complex cognitive skills can take 20 plus years to fully develop, and others like our ability to see and hear and touch and smell will develop over a much shorter period of time um, early on. So the evidence says that uh, healthy environments, access to health care, uh, access to, new, to quality nutrition and other factors that the report focuses on prenatally and early postnatally can, can have positive impacts on outcomes. This is Jen DeVoe. I think the other point that the committee wanted to highlight is this is an important period in life that sets odds for optimal health and an important period in life to intervene with prevention strategies, buffering early detection and treatment, and that it's never too late, that it's important to detect and refer at any point if providers and other caregivers notice that a child is at risk or having adverse experiences, and that the mitigation and buffering interventions that are recommended here can be implemented at any point Ideally, prevention and early detection and early response is important, but it's never too late given the plasticity of the brain and the biological systems. Our next question is for Dr. Nadine Burke-Harris. Are there good examples of community-based integration and collaboration between early child development programs and primary health care programs? Yes, and we um, uh, we listed a number of these examples uh, in the report, and um, I am um, a, a, so I don't I don't have the specific examples in front of me, but but we did um, uh, look at a number of of models that that do exactly that, um, and and highlighted them in the report, and we looked for models that had uh, evidence or, or um, uh, of some effectiveness or improvement on outcomes. This is Albert uh, from the Alliance for Early Success. I would just add that um, one of the things in the early care education chapter that we highlighted was the Head Start model. Um, and I see some questions about the you know, sort of uh, alignment or integration of early care education and health. We did find, you know, the, the broad evidence in terms of the research on Head Start does suggest that it does have 
positive um, health outcomes. It, it's not a you know, perfect model, obviously, and, it, and, the, and you can you, and, and use some improvement and, and additional resources. But the, um, the standards um, that are embedded in the federal guidelines for Head Start programs um, uh, very explicitly uh, connect early care and education and health services. Um, and uh, and I think we can, you know, early care education systems writ large, whether it's a state pre-K program, child care programs, et cetera, I think can look to Head Start as sort of a blueprint or foundation to build from. Um, and, and, and I think we all should think about how to strengthen that part of, this, of, the, of the Head Start program so that, and, and expand eligibility as the re, um, uh, report recommends so that more kids can benefit from, from those kinds of integrated, integrated, integrated services. The next question is for Dr. Jennifer DeVoe. Does this report have specific recommendations about best practices on how preconception, prenatal, postpartum pediatric systems might better collaborate and align? There's a fair amount of information in the healthcare chapter, chapter five, as well as chapter eight, um, given that many of the sectors that we described integrate and collaborate for early childhood development and support of families. Here's where we also talk about there being significant barriers. And one example I will highlight is that many of these sectors in local communities, states, and um, federal government have a significant amount of important information and data about children that are at risk and families that are at risk, but there are currently a number of barriers to sharing that data and integrating that data, which would enable many of these caregivers and providers to better understand and better serve these families in a more immediate and rapid way. Um, and I also, um, in my own personal experience as a primary care physician, um, there are a number of programs that can be strengthened where physicians and other healthcare providers can identify at-risk children. And as um, many of the models that were highlighted that are evidence-based in some communities now enable primary care physicians and others on the team to immediately refer patients and families to critical social services such as housing assistance and food assistance and these programs are showing um, significant promise and evidence at improving outcomes and they need to be expanded and so there are many recommendations regarding how to expand those programs and how to build on that evidence. The next question goes to Dr. Natalie Slopin. Almost half of children in the United States have experienced at least one adverse childhood experience. How do we change the trajectory for those children? Thank you. So we under, when we understand the root causes of poor health, which are extensively outlined within chapter two, chapter three of this report, that's when we can begin to break the cycle of inequity. And as we discussed throughout the report, the earlier that we can intervene, the less expensive and more effective our interventions will be. So the science suggests that we, when we enact different systems level changes, um, ideally as early as possible, and support caregivers who provide the foundation for healthy development, we can change the trajectory for children who are facing adverse experiences. Um, and we still have a lot to learn from a research perspective in terms of which interventions will work best for which children in which communities. The next question is, are there specific home visiting programs established and what are the specific services that home visiting programs should provide? Um, so this is Albert from the Alliance for Success. The, the uh, report does cover some of the evidence-based models and home visiting. And uh, as many people kn I, I think I'm aware of, uh, the federal government has, um, uh, the McVie program specifically has um, uh, 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 released 
uh, guidelines about which evidence-based programs are uh, um, supported by the federal funding stream. So um, there are probably others out there that um, I, you know, other people in the committee might uh, be able to talk about. Um, but that's one one um, uh, guidance that we can look to to think about which programs are evidence-based. And this is Jennifer DeVoe. I would just follow that up as well with um, the recommendations that these home visiting programs, whether they be um, implemented with a nurse visiting the home, a social worker, or an early childhood education expert, that these co programs coordinate with the early care and education and coordinate with the healthcare system and coordinate with the other sectors that we described as well. The next question is for Albert Watt. What existing early care and education programs can be used to implement the recommendations in this report? Um, so, so just to uh, re reiterate, the you know, you thinking about Head Start as a model, but in addition to that, the report covers a number of uh, um, social emotional development programs and curriculum that. Uh, have again evidence, you know, pretty strong evidence. In addition to that, um, there's some research that we review around early childhood mental health consult consultants um, that have shown some evidence in proving practices in um, early care and education programs. Uh, uh, some of it relates to um, uh, trauma-informed practice and also uh, the reduction of uh, suspension and expulsions uh, in in these early childhood programs. Thank you. The next question is for Dr. Burke Harris. What are the evidence-based strategies to reduce stress from adverse experiences for both caregivers and children under five? Um, so uh, what the evidence shows is that um, number one, um, uh, safe, stable, stable, and nurturing relationships and environments are healing for kids. Uh, and so when we look at the evidence-based practices for supporting, uh, uh, for addressing early adversity, uh, the strongest um, evidence is for uh, interventions that take a two-generation model that address both the caregiver and the child, and also does that in a way that is um, uh, addressing uh, the key drivers for for the caregiver to allow the caregiver to be a buffer uh, and to address whether it's their own history of adversity um, and to provide them with support to create um, a, a safe, stable, and nurturing environment for the child. Uh, and and um, some of these programs and looking across the evidence are associated with not only uh, improved uh, neurodevelopmental, cognitive, and behavioral outcomes, but also improved inflammatory outcomes uh, and uh, uh, endocrine and metabolic uh, outcomes as well. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that's what we're seeing. The next question is for Dr. Elizabeth Davis. Um, the report mentioned the implementation of paid family leave. Did you discuss um, how that would be implemented and paid for? So the recommendation of the uh, committee about paid parental leave focuses on the, the importance the science places on the relationship between the caregiver and the infant. And paid parental leave, given that um, many parents can't afford to take an unpaid leave or will lose their job if they take if if they if they leave. Um, it's important to give them the time to build that relationship um, and and have begin um, building positive parenting practices. Um, the actual the the committee did not get into the details of how to implement a policy that was viewed as beyond our scope. But in looking at the literature. You know, there is evidence of the positive health effects of short parental leaves, um, pay, paid leave. Um, there's less evidence um, for longer leave. So I think that's something that needs more study. And so the committee recommendation is that um, a paid parental leave program be implemented, 
but that some research is needed to investigate how best to implement it in order to impact um, child health and maternal health outcomes. Um, and so thinking about how long the leave should be and the funding mechanisms um, needs further study. We have a question for Dr. DeVoe. Given the substantial impacts of early adversity, the prevention of adversities and disparities is critical. What social, structural, economic, and political changes are feasible to be promoted and implemented? Thanks for that question. Um, our committee spent a lot of time looking at a number of evidence-based interventions that are already implemented in different areas. And these are some of those that could be feasibly implemented in a short-term time frame. And some of those have been touched upon already, such as home visiting, paid parental leave, expansion of programs that are already in existence, like supplemental nutrition programs and early education programs in which children who are already eligible are not accessing those services. In some cases, a minority of available children a minority of eligible children are accessing those services or have them available. So reducing the barriers, strengthening existing programs can be done immediately or in the very short term. The committee also recognized and um, the science tells us that there are a number of longer term interventions and recommendations that will take a significant amount of time and these are also equally, if not more important, and we should continue to work towards the longer term solutions while at the same time taking action immediately. And of course, continuing some of the incredibly important research that's needed that's been mentioned by Dr. Davis, Dr. Slopin, and other areas within the report that were highlighted. Our next question goes to Dr. Burke Harris. In your report, you make it clear that no sector alone can advance health equity. What role do the non-health sectors that are mentioned play? Um, for example, early education, housing, food security. Um, uh, substantial. Uh, this, is, this is what the evidence is showing us is that our environment interacts with our biology to shape our health. And so from that standpoint, our, uh, um, you know, the uh, early childhood education, um, as we heard from Albert, has an important opportunity to be an intervention to reduce health disparities, in part because early childhood educators, um, uh, if they receive training on how to recognize and address early adversity and how to be a buffer. What we find is that, um, as I mentioned before, these safe, stable, and nurturing relationships environments are healing, and our early, uh, early care and education systems have an opportunity to be part of that buffering system. What we understand is that while the cumulative dose of adversity uh, sets the odds in terms of risk, the cumulative dose of buffering uh, is also critically important, and that is one of the things that the report seeks to um, uh, give guidance on is how we can increase that cumulative uh, uh, dose of buffering. Similarly, with housing, uh, there's an opportunity to reduce the cumulative dose of adversity by ensuring that children have uh, safe, stable, and adequate housing. Um, uh, and so there's, a, there's in fact, it's, uh, the, the, the response by definition has to be an, an, an ecological response because of the scope of the challenge is so significant. Thank you. And we're running um, close to the end of our time, so we have room for one last question, and it goes to Dr. Pat Levitt. Why focus on the primary caregiver? Why focus on the primary care? So um, the research uh, over a very long period of time has recognized that uh, the infant's early environment is defined in large part by the individual who spends the most time with, with uh, that child uh, post-birth. Those interactions and relationships are um, actively building 
brain circuits and having an impact on other health systems in the infant that are going to establish a strong foundation for um, future development. So in some sense, it's, it's focusing on building a strong foundation, which, we've, which the report emphasizes uh, certainly starts prenatally, and there's growing evidence that it can start preconception as well. So it's, it's been the focus of research to demonstrate, I think, that those, the amount of time, the, the, those adults who are spending the most time with the, with the infant during these periods of time when the systems are just beginning to mature is the most effective uh, factor for building a strong foundation that's going to then facilitate later development. I think that sums it up. Oh, yes. Um, and then we, oh, we do have one final, final question. Um, can you speak to the impact of the current immigrant policies in terms of creating child and family adversity? So evidence shows that trauma and adversity can have lifelong consequences and that chronic stress activation increases the risk for poor physical and mental health as well as cognitive outcomes. And building on what Dr. Levitt just talked about is a child's relationship with a caregiver is the single most important element for buffering any adversity. And then the, there is solid evidence that being separated from a primary caregiver can lead to toxic stress which impacts mental and physical health. And the science also shows that the longer the exposure, the worse the outcomes. Thank you, Dr. DeVoe. And it looks like those are all the questions we have time for today. We had hundreds of people join today's webinar, so I apologize if we didn't have time to get to your question. Um, but as we said before, the report and related resources are at nationalacademies.org slash vibrant healthy kids. Slides and recordings should be available there within a week. Once you exit this webinar, you will be redirected to that page. I would like to thank our committee once again and thank you all for taking the time out of your day to join us.